I just wanted to, we're going to end our symposium with a, something that um, I'm very glad for the first time that we've been able to ever do in our fiber shed is actually invite another fiber shed to come and close us out. Um, as we grow these local economies, uh, people are taking these, you know, fi fiber shed as a, a noun. It's, you know, it's, if you look it on, up it online, it's, it's, it's like a watershed or a food shed. It's a fiber shed, and people use the term for what to describe these strategic geographies. You know, we help engender a movement around it as much as we have the capacity to, but we really inspire people to just take it and run. I mean, that's we are at the go time, right? So, <laughs> um, what I am excited about is to watch how other people take the noun and grow their movement, and sometimes. I will look up from my computer <laughs> and I will be like, oh, wow, there is um, people doing things that they are leapfrogging over our work. And to watch that happen um, blows your mind. You're just like, wow. I mean, it must be for the carbon farming. You know, you watch people take the work and they run and they go farther than you ever could have ever imagined in your own, you know, frontal lobe could have come up with. So beyond your wildest hopes. Um, so the Upper Canada Fiber Shed, I got the pleasure of uh, going there in January and working at their National Textile Art Museum, working, presenting, uh, also meeting some of the people in the Upper Canada Fiber Shed, staying at one of their homes, um, meeting and greeting, doing natural dye workshops and learning from the Canadian uh, way of being and, and realizing that um, they had a lot of the same exact issues that we had and the way they were moving forward and through those hurdles and obstacles was deeply inspiring to me. So I invited them here to talk to us. Why not get inspired from a sister fiber shed, you know? So um, I would like to invite at first, it, um, Peggy, are you coming first? Yeah. Jennifer? So Jennifer, Jennifer Osborne, farmer and craftsperson, and I wear her felt booties in the evenings to keep my toes warm in the winter. Thank you. <laughs> so. First of all, I'd like to thank everybody. Um, it's a huge, huge honor to be here. Uh, unfortunately, the co-founder could not be here. She had a baby about a month ago, and she was going to try and get down, but she just kind of went, you know what? No. Because um, she also lives about four hours north of kind of her biggest major airport. So it's a bit of a hike for her, but Becky, uh, I hope you're watching and you're here in spirit. Um, so yeah, so the Upper Canada Fiber Shed, um, first of all, I'd also like to say is, oh my gosh, you guys can do so much stuff down here. Like, serious envy, really serious envy. Um, we have, well, like, and I'll get into that, but so yes, yeah, so we are the Upper Canada Fiber Shed. Um, our website is uppercanadafibershed.ca. Uh, can we go to, ah, here we go. How do I use this? <laughs> I'm a farmer, I don't get out much, so. <laughs> okay, oh, wrong way. Okay, so yeah, so our place in the landscape. Um, I've never been to California. Um, I haven't actually seen a lot of California. I did see Highway 1 at midnight, and that, it's very interesting because I could see about 30 feet in front of me. Um, but it looked really beautiful, even just the landscape. And when I woke up this morning, it was like, wow, this is really cool. Um, to give you an idea of where we are, um, Ontario specifically, it's kind of just north of New York State. Um, and essentially, it goes from Carolineal Forest to Boreal Forest and a lot of transition. So there are large areas of agricultural land. There's large flat areas. Um, it would probably fit into Montana, Washington, California, and Nevada. It's massive. It's really, really large. Um, and it's all different. And the majority of the people actually live right right by the border by Lake Ontario and Lake Superior and Huron. Um, and to also give you an idea is, uh, I do believe California is about 30 odd million people. That is about our country. So just to give you an idea of population density and scale, we're really tiny compared to the US. Um, but our trees are also different. So when you get up to the boreal forest, kind of about halfway up the forest, halfway, halfway up the 
province, um, you're pretty much looking at poplar and pine and birch, and that's pretty much it. And it's trees and rocks and rocks and trees and trees and rocks for about 15 or 20 hours going through into Manitoba. Um, when you get further south, you have uh, a variety of different trees from oaks to willows to some of the Carolinian as Osage Orange and things like that. So it's a huge variation. And of course, we have bears, coyotes, um, wolves, all the similar things. You talk to some people, we don't have uh, cougars, but we do. So it's very varied. And yeah, it, it hilly, uh, not quite as hilly as here, though. Uh, and we do actually have an incredibly long history of wool. Um, I don't know how many of you might recognize the Bay Blanket, the Hudson Bay Point Blanket. Um, very, very large part of our history. Um, ironically, they were all made in England. But, <laughs> but so Ontario specifically has uh, probably the, the biggest, most varied wool history in the country. And uh, it goes across, uh, kind of across the region as well. So it was not only uh, indigenous Canadians, but also the English and French. And it was just, there's a very long and, and storied history, and yes, uh, something that we are taught in history classes is basically, whether it's, it's true or not, I guess remains to be seen, but I wouldn't surprise me that the Bay Blanket was actually a big part of the smallpox epidemic of uh, Indigenous Canadians. So it's, it's, it's done a lot of things. The Bay Blanket has, as you see, has had coats, and um, yeah, it's one of those things that a lot of Canadians really hang on to. So like you, it was really, it, it, the stuff I've heard here today could easily say, wow, that's just like home. Um, at one point, we used to uh, produce about 14 million pounds of wool. We're now down to 3 million. And that actually only dropped in about 19, the late 60s. Uh, and now we actually only have about uh, 800,000 sheep in the country. Um, and it rises a little bit, but not much. And I do believe that uh, the last year, at least in Ontario, it was about three. 300,000 head went in, so could be Canada. But we've really dropped, like really dropped. Um, Ontario probably had about, just, and this is just in Ontario, probably had about 40 mills that did different things 100 years ago. Um, and we would, we would grow wool for the, um, we would grow wool for the uh, British Army, for their army uniforms, very much like the US did. Uh, we also had a very large linen industry in Ontario, um, all up and down Lake Huron, and once again would actually do canvas. Uh, unfortunately, nobody grows linen commercially there pretty much in the country. So most of the people that actually worked in the mills were women. They were paid, they were, they were paid less, and just like many women are still paid less today. Um, and the majority of the mill owners were English men. Um, so you know what, I'm just going to leave that there. <laughs> uh, and of course, mills were dangerous places. Um, I don't know whether or not anybody has actually seen a, a belt-driven mill, but they take off fingers, they take off limbs, they're really dangerous. Um, and of course, a lot of women, younger children, uh, they would also work in these mills. And once again, 60 hours a week. So thanks to uh, very large union movements in the US, we don't have that anymore, mostly. So anyway, so that is the history of, of kind of wool in Ontario in our bioregion. And jump forward to now, and Becky Porley and I, we have something up there called the Guelph Organic Conference, which is the largest organic conference in, in uh, Canada. And I have commonly talked there, uh, usually about forest farming and permaculture. And I brought fiber one year, and I was kind of the very first person to bring fiber in. And Becky came up to me and said, do you know what a fiber shed is? And I went, yeah. And that was it. And that was in 2013, and we've been causing trouble ever since. So the team of who Upper Canada Fiber Shed is, and this is just kind of what we could fit on the page. There are so many other people that I will mention after going through. Um, but there's Becky Porlier, and she actually, I'll have to read her credentials. Uh, yeah, she has a BA in anthropology, 
and uh, capacity development. She's actually perfectly suited to what she's doing now. And uh, she's also a mother of two. As I said, she's just had a baby. But she actually did a term in uh, Bhutan, and that was where she really, really learned about economies of place. And the story she does like to tell me, and I know I'll get this wrong, Becky, but I'll try, um, is they, were, they would actually, um, in Bhutan, there were a lot of dairy farmers, and they had kind of the heritage dairy breed that was there that they would milk. And at some point, some Jersey cow genetics had come in. And the farmers really liked the Jersey cow genetics, or they'd cross them. And they could make money with the Jersey cow genetics. And um, basically, as international de development, they were coming in and saying, no, get back to your heritage breed. And the farmers were going, no, because we'll starve. And it was, she was just, it was a very interesting dynamic between those two parties of what outsiders wanted and what the people that lived there wanted. And it really kind of educated her. And when she told me this story myself, of how important it is to listen to the people that actually live in a place all the time, as opposed to coming in and trying to fix things. And I think that goes all over the world. Uh, there's me. I'll just kind of skip over that. So I'm a shepherd and an artist. I'm a felter. Um, we raise our flock for sheep, dairy, and meat. We are Canada's only dedicated sheep uh, milk ice cream farm and felting flock. Uh, also been a permaculture artist and designer for, for years. Um, and then there's Sarah Jean Harrison, who would please stand up, who is our digital, digital storyteller, who in all honesty would not a lot of what we accomplish would not be possible without her because to be able to reach out on social media on a regular basis and have a consistent voice has been so crucial for us. Becky tried to do it, I tried to do it, we're both busy and it just, you know, I'm not a writer, Becky's a mum and it's like, oh sorry, no, sorry, got it spit up, gotta go. Um, it just, it didn't work and Sarah Jean really aspired to this and so we really do have to, to completely thank her. And we also have Peggy Sue, who you will hear lots about, and she has about 30 slides to herself, so I'll just mention her name. Um, but there's also the Weavers, um, Deborah and uh, Bree and Nicole, who has got a wool study going on through one of our local universities. Um, so there's lots and lots of people behind us. I'm just standing here because I was the one to told to come up here. Uh, so our fiber shed is actually 250 miles around Toronto. Uh, the funny thing is it's actually kind of all of Canada now because we have such a pathetic fiber landscape um, that has anything to do with local. So really we take, in, we take inquiries and we take people from Nova Scotia out to BC. We have actually had inquiries, people wanting to buy local Canadian yarn from uh, the Yukon, which is like just south of Alaska. So, and the big thing is, of course, is that we had to build our network. Um, I don't know what it's like down here, but ver everything's very much siloed. Um, I was hearing this echoed here is that basically sheep are meat, and that's what sheep are for. Uh, there are very few f small fiber uh, flocks. Um, but just even having the conversations between farmers and fiber producers and knitters and spinners and urban and rural. Those were so important and we're still making those connections now. Um, we, and so we've really had to do an awful lot and I'm not used to having to I'll get to some of the challenges of where we started because we've been evolving and with Fiber Shed here being a model and seeing what would fit in with what our landscape is like. We'll get to the Backyard London project, yeah. So we actually started because we have a very different funding landscape up in Ontario. We really don't have things like big foundations to, to uh, apply for money, even as a not-for-profit. They're extremely limited. Uh, so we wanted to try and start as a business first, and that's how actually we started. Up until this year, we were basically running as a business, uh, or it is a no-profit uh, organization as opposed to a not-for-profit. 
um, it was run on basically if we would put our personal money in and if we were lucky enough we might get some of it out but we believed enough in this project that we kept going um, but we did manage to get an online store up we managed to get members we managed to get producer members and we would do things like uh, there's a maker festival in Toronto which we won an award for and we actually won the award for just showing people how wool is processed from like bats into uh, basically felt and then Peggy Sue actually made something right there and how knitting worked and it went over really, really well. But it was very, very challenging because, well, you know, pockets get empty pretty quickly. So we decided after many iterations to go for a not-for-profit model. Um, and now this also opens us up to partnering with other people and other organizations because we're not going to do this alone. As I said, remember, whole country, California. So what do we have? I mentioned earlier, really envious of what you guys can do. Um, but we actually have a lot of producers that are making stuff. So we don't have, as, as much as I'd really like to, we're just beginning to get into the prototype. We kind of did everything backwards. We said, we're going to sell stuff first, and then we're going to research it, because we needed the cash flow. Um, but we actually have producers that do blankets. They do, uh, not, we have very few natural dye growers, but they're coming out. They do buttons, they do yarns, they do clothing, and you'll find all out all about the clothing. Um, and also on their farms, they do pelts, they do soaps. They said, I'm a dairy farmer, um, so I make ice cream. We have other, uh, another couple of uh, dairy farmers that do cheeses that also sell their yarns and pelts. Um, we have a few people that do pillows and rovings and all kinds of stuff. And of course, we also have alpaca, sheep, and goats. But once again, quite, a f quite few. Uh, down to our wool challenge. So we can't even grow merino. Um, if they actually have them there, everything changes. It's too wet. We're just too wet. Um, said in the winter, we actually can go down to minus 40 wind chill. In the summer, we can go up to, uh, I think it's 104 Fahrenheit humidity. So it's a really, really big stretch. And we will get then two months of drought. Um, and then spring and fall are basically, yeah, barnyards or mud pits. It's just that simple. So there's a, we have a lot of challenges with a lot of wool. So we actually produce mostly medium coarse wool. Fine wools are really rare. Basically, fine wools are our alpaca. It's that simple. Uh, we have, I think, and the West Coast is different. On but because of Ontario's climate, we are far more akin to Scotland. So really, we should be looking to what Scotland does. And they do tweeds. So we've had a lot of interesting kind of things of what we're going to look at more like a tweed-like fabric. Um, and what you can do with that. Uh, we also, of course, house a lot of our sheep six months of the year because there's often snow on the ground and absolutely nothing to eat. So they eat a lot of hay, uh, which makes them really dirty. And it's very challenging to keep sheep in a barn with coats on all winter because it, it's just really not pretty. Um, so that is kind of, that was actually, I think, from the alpaca breeders in the US. But basically, the majority of our wool would probably be four or five or worse. So, and we, our flocks are, a lot of our flocks are, the fiber flocks are quite small, but we do have a few flocks that are a couple of thousand a sheep. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it's very challenging. Cleanliness is a big deal because we don't have the option of range pasturing. Uh, the land, the parts of the land are too small. It's too difficult. Um, it's just not what we do on, on kind of the, in the east. So like you, like just beforehand, uh, we're looking for, uses for our coarse wool, um, considering about probably 80 to 95% of the wool we produce is coarse, and it is about 25 microns up and dirty. And once again, like you, the Canadian Cooperative of Wool Growers, it most of it, actually just about all of it goes to China. Um, so our networks, but although we haven't actually done a ton of of research yet, we're getting there. Um, very interested about carbon farming, the wool book we're now looking at, reproducing one of these we're now looking at, because we've gotten so many amazing ideas from down here. Um, but we have made some really amazing partnerships. One is Nicole's uh, wool study. So we're actually embarking on, well, 
Upper Canada Fibre Shed, the Ontario uh, Sheep Marketing Agency, which is kind of the commercial sheep breeders. We've actually managed to make connections with the commercial sheep breeders market and we're finding a lot of interest from the larger scale breeders and and uh, shepherds just because they see their wool going to waste uh, we actually have a lot of Rito are caught I don't know whether or not you have that down here but it's a Canadian breed and it has a lot of fin in it and dorset so it's kind of it's kind of like a long, wavy dorset, and it's actually not a bad wool. It does a lot, and so we have an awful lot of that, and if it's kept clean, it can make very, very nice product. Um, maybe not next to the skin like merino, but you know what? Coats, socks it would do really well, and it has uses. Um, so that's been really amazing, and teamed up with the University of Toronto to actually do a wool inventory and to see what connections are needed between the farmers and the consumers, and just to have the understanding, as you heard here this morning, that, um, you know, there's a lot of work to keeping that wool clean, and there's a lot of challenges. Um, we also have uh, made kind of some connections with the campaign for wool and trying to connect, do some cross promotion there. Peggy Sue Collection, who she, Peggy Sue will be up very briefly. Once I'm done, uh, we also, we had Rebecca down to the contemporary, uh, oh gosh, I can never get this right, the Contemporary Textile Studio Co-op uh, in Toronto, and Rebecca came up to do some dye workshops, and they've been really supportive because they are in an urban area, and they kind of really, they really work for us to get a lot of our message, and just, there's a ton of interested people, like here with dyes, and just where, where their fibers are coming from that they're using them, that they're using. Um, the Fashion Arts and Creative Textile Studio at the uh, Canadian Centre for Rural Creativity. This is a brand new initiative. Um, down here, you guys have some really interesting, I call them skills schools, but they're kind of um, non-degree granting schools that you can go learn stuff and everything from cheese making to uh, wood carving to quilting. We don't have anything like that at home, nothing. So you can't go to go learn intensive wood carving and stay at a place for a week. That, like, we just don't have it. So that's kind of what the Creative Center for, the Canadian Center for Rural Creativity, and I've got a few slides of them. Uh, Taproot Fiber Lab in Nova Scotia. She, they actually, they have invented a mini mill for linen because we have absolutely no bast fibers at all, no fast fiber processing at all in Canada. Nothing, nada. So they've actually developed mini mill linen processing, which is a stunning achievement. And they, they can actually like process it like a Belfast mini mill. Um, and they're growing it, and they're producing local linen and local cloth. Uh, unfortunately, we're probably five years away from it actually being kind of commercially viable. Um, and of course, local producers, artisans, makers, retailers, and mills. Uh, now, this is really interesting because I am fascinated and have been for a very long time about the kind of skill schools you used to have down here. And they do everything that, so this is just starting, and dye gardens, but they're also looking at very similar to what Fibershed is doing down here, is hoping to fund actual things like community felting mills, uh, training programs for people how to use that machinery, how to use the spinning machinery, because we're finding that we really, really need those people. And we've heard it again, those skilled laborers that it's, you know, it is a skill and you do need passion to do a lot of this. So our challenges, first of all, have been scale. Um, we have a lot of very small fiber producers that have traditionally uh, raised animals for the hand spinning market. And once again, uh, all of California, Canada. So there's not, quite the amount of hand spinners. So, you know, and a lot of people keep them for themselves. Um, I was talking about the fiber type, pretty much all coarse. The skilled labor, funding, no funding. Uh, connecting the populations, the urban rural is very, very desperate. And then how do we fit in? And that has been one of the biggest things. And what has been really interesting and guided through Fiber Shed down here is we really are now an education and outreach 
organization to make those connections, to help the designers like Peggy Sue find the producers like myself who wants to sell their fleece and say, here, I produce X amount of pounds of wool twice a year. This is what it's good for. Please buy it from me. And you can kind of see some of the other things up there because I really want to get to pa Peggy Sue because she's far more interesting. And this is actually one of Peggy Sue's creations. And I would actually like to introduce Peggy Sue of Peggy Sue Collection, who won the Tor Toronto Fashion Arts Incubator Award <laughs> with, a com with a complete collection of all locally sourced, Ontar Ontario sourced, milled, and made all in Ontario, and this is a high fashion collection. Like, it's, it's little. Actually, this coat's probably better travel than I am. Um, hi everyone. I know it's been a, a long and very inspiring day, so thank you so much for staying and it's really um, a sincere pleasure to get to speak with all of you today. Um, I know that we have been, um, Fibershed and myself have been really looking forward to coming here and to getting to meet all of you as well as to share our stories because after knowing your Fibershed for so long, um, throwing around and, and really trying to workroom your um, problems, initiatives, and, and um, you know, advances, it's, it's quite refreshing to get to be in a room of people where I don't have to necessarily redefine all those terms that in the general population I'm always having to redefine. So um, what a pleasure to get to have this discussion in the next phase of things among uh, fellow fiber shedders. So thank you again. Uh, so I'd like to start with um, a bit about my background briefly uh, because as as an artist it's it's quite important to know the why. Um, you know, we're all where we are for a reason. We were shaped by our, um, you know, experiences thusly. Uh, so, there we go. Um, this is just a brief overview to give you sort of an idea of what it is you're going to see um, at the end. I'm going to be talking about the development in order to reach um, our runway collection line that you see here on the bottom, as well as uh, some of the fibers and processes you see as well. Um, so, I trained at the Rhode Island School of Design. I'm originally from Los Angeles, California. And when, um, when I was in school, I, I majored um, in apparel design and my focus was sculptural fashion. Uh, so I was very interested in costume design and avant-garde fashion. And you'll see that uh, the designers that I worked with um, Designers in Los Angeles, designers in London on their runway collection um, echoed those interests. Um, but however, when I graduated, uh, the, uh, the industry had really slumped and jobs were scarce. Um, and those who had graduated before me had even just lost their jobs and had had much more experience than I had. So why on earth would you hire someone fresh out of school with no experience? So the the arena of jobs that I landed into were mass market fashion. Um, I heard a, a story echoed earlier that sounds quite similar to mine. I worked for a very large corporation with a very large global supply chain. It didn't sleep. I went to sleep and my counterpart overseas took over for me. Uh, we would wake up the next morning, import duties would have shifted and we moved our production over, you know, in a day to new countries. You know, oh, it can't, not, not English speaking? Well, that, turn everything visual, no problem. Oh, they do speak English. Great. Back to the old tech packs. Um, so in this system, I, I really became aware of how fashion, the second largest polluter of the world, really um, existed um, at the expense of people and planet for profit. And as uh, my community um, 
turns out I fell into the farm crowd. All of my friends decided to become livestock farmers um, and, and vegetable farmers. And so um, when you live in the city and work in the city, your main goal is to escape the city. And so my weekends were spent in upstate New York uh, with, with my fellow farm friends. And um, I quickly learned, you know, morning chores and lambing and bonded over bottle feeding and had these farmers asking me like, oh, well, you, you work in fashion, there are natural fibers in there, so, you know, what are your labor rates like? What are the harvesting seasons like on your end? Because at this time of a recession, I was able to see my peers having to build their livelihood based on pricing at local farmers markets. I got to see how a dollar more for a dozen eggs over a period of time made a significant difference. How paying more per pound for a heritage breed animal made a difference. And so when they started asking me these questions of sustainability, traceability, um, I knew that the answers were sorted and I knew that I didn't know them. So I did my research. Um, went to our trade shows and began asking, where's where's the North American fiber? I know that there are farmers out here who are farming it, producing it. I know that there are local mills. Why aren't they at the trade shows? And I found out, well, according to the global fashion markets, they're the North American product isn't really good enough. We can't really show it next to our European sourced goods. We have our brand to maintain. We can't really compromise that. So, whew, um, I started reaching out to mills and farmers and finding out, are you making things? Are they viable in the fashion market? I mean, we make millions of garments a year, so if I can connect any portion of North America with this production, okay, here we go. So, in finding that out, I found out that the big mills that came, um, that survived, um, were the ones that took on large military and industrial contracts meaning that small-scale production was next to near impossible. Um, in Canada, it's just starting to come back. Um, in the States, there's a lot more progress being made. You guys are starting to now have medium-sized mills, not just mini and large. In Canada, it's still very much mini and large. And like Jennifer mentioned, if you want you know, cotton or any other basque fiber, good luck. So we are still very dependent on America for our plant fibers. We are still very dependent on America for our plant fibers. Think of that when you put on a pair of jeans. So made in Canada versus product of Canada. It's really important to look at your labels. Made in America, that means one thing. Made in Canada, totally different thing. Made in Canada is a 51% total cost of good, uh, cost of the good, and it's very easy to make a garment overseas and then have it finished in Canada. Well, the finishing in Canada on a Canadian labor rate oftentimes will fit that 51% criteria. So it's important to understand the politics behind making something appear to look like it's locally made. Um, so. We're proud to say that a lot of the products in our line are product of Canada. Um, you know, certain things. Um, our sweaters, uh, a lot of our hand-woven outerwear. Um, so I would ask, you know, that's something that ev each one of us can practice. When you see that something is made in a country, there's a reason it's made in that country. They have that machinery. They have governments enforcing those labor rates. Um, you know, ask the questions, get the knowledge, make the choices you want to make. Um, so when I started developing my collection, I wanted to create a company that used all of these skills that I had learned from my very large experience with global supply chains, but was actually a force for good. You know, it's, it's, it's hard when you realize as an artist, your gifting relies, um, is found in an industry that's it's actually doing a lot more bad than it is good. It just feels great. Uh, so, <laughs> so I began... Um, aware of the fiber shed movement and very much excited about the people that were asking those questions and becoming a part of those initiatives, um, I thought, you know what, I, I really want to make a fashion line that's going to do a lot of good in the world, um, or some good, you know, if possible. And while I was forming 
while I was forming my supply chain, uh, I contacted the Upper Canada Fiber Shed. And so we began actually building my supply chain and their membership list and directory um, together. So we just freely shared information back and forth. Have you met this person? Have you met that person? What, we don't have someone to connect this process. I found that person. And it became a wonderful free flow of information. So in light of that, if you ever go onto our website, our full supply chain is there. If you want to contact any of them, I'm happy to connect you. Because at the end of the day, I'm not fully keeping all of these guys in business. So I'm not going to be keeping their information from you. They need your help. <laughs> so, um, so these are some of the fibers. As Jennifer mentioned, yes, we are... It's harder to find our fine fibers, so we use a lot of alpaca. We do about a 75-25 alpaca to wool blend. We're very specific about the wool breeds we use. However, the alpaca market um, in Canada, those, those farmers, they're doing a, quite a good job, some better than others. Same can be said with wool farmers. So it's, it's pretty exciting, actually, to get to know all of these farmers and to learn what their practices are. So, um, so, um, just to touch back real quick, we the whole collection that you will see um, is all natural. All those colors are natural. None of them are dyed. Not that we don't believe in botanical dyeing, but we are slowly trying to spread education. And there's only so much time you get with a person before they just lose interest and walk away. I mean, galleries, 2.6 seconds per painting, right? So we're trying to keep the story to the point and... Uh, and, and meaningful. So I'd just like to talk about Jennifer. I know, don't worry, it's okay. Um, so when I met Jennifer, she was a radical farmer, which is important to say. Um, given, given current viewpoints of things, you know, rural versus urban sectors, and how, you know, recently they've sort of eh, stopped talking to one another, um, it's important to mention that I work with radical farmers in Canada. You know, they are strong, and they have gumption and they are doing crazy things and the individuals that I work with in urban sectors they eat seasonally and they take an active part in what they consume and so it's 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 pretty exciting to see that these groups are coming together in really meaningful future ways to create change that's here to stay. So Jennifer, one of these radical farmers, uh, sheared twice a year. Yeah, that's radical in Canada. That absolutely is. Because you put your flock in danger. What if they don't put their wool on quick enough for that cold snap that's coming in Canada, which is significant. Um, Jennifer was also one of the few farmers I met who was leveraging her animals two, now three different ways. She was interested in fiber, but she needed, she knew that there was capacity there. Right now in Canada, the fiber farmers that exist are, they're small and they're growing to medium. So when you meet a medium smallish that's growing even more to a medium large, it's very exciting. Um, because for me, the idea is getting this into a repeatable product that when people consume can actually give back to the local community. Another uh, farmer that I work with is Pote's Corners Alpaca. And what was so radical about them was not only did they use their alpaca for fiber, but they let their animals live the entirety of their lifespans and then tanned them. And the meat was a byproduct of the fiber, as in it became those meat stick sausagey things that you throw in your bag when you're camping, um, which have so many other spices that it's okay if it's a little tough and it's a little old. Um, but yeah, this this park, this you know farmer was willing to look beyond their alpacas as pets and to think of them as viable agricultural fiber products, which in Canada was rather radical. So here we had our, our color source um, combined with a really beautiful wool source. And then um, need to say our first mill that we worked with was Utazel, a Frilton fiber mill. And she is a mini mill. We entered into this very large competition and we needed a really quick turnover and she was able to really work with with us um, you know she's she's my mad scientist she will try anything and 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 she's fearless I mean I, it's it scares me sometimes what she's willing to do with her with her milling equipment um, but she's she tries it and so she milled all the fiber for our runway collection and still continues to do our you know the crazy R&D that I know no one is just no one wants to do she loves it um, 
And then again, in learning about um, in learning about this this process behind a natural material, you know, I, I came from a a, um, a fiber understanding, of, you know, of the New York region, you know, of the East Coast region, and it, it's, it's it's remarkably different where I am today in the GTA region, um, and so I firmly believe that as a designer, it's 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 really not good enough anymore to make pretty product. It really there's too much information out there. And it's really important to connect with the people along your supply chain and to understand where the weakest parts are of your supply chain. So I'll just harken back to what was said earlier today, shearing, that, that, is, that is very scary for me, how an entire growth of fiber can be completely degraded by bad shearing. When you are relying on your annual take for a good shear, if that shear can't keep the bottom tine of their comb down, um, or if they're just whipping through them because they just want to make their dollar per head count, yeah, that's, that's tricky. Um, you know, you go from having lace weight yarn to coarse spun, maybe. So I got involved. I learned alpaca shearing. I went and volunteered. Um, you know, my poor husband who's in the crowd, love you, man. Um, our thing is when I meet a farmer, it says, you know, our, our shtick is, you know, come time for shearing, you give us a call. If you need extra hands, we're there. Um, because they're just, there's never enough hands and there's never enough time. Farmers don't get snow days, they get double duty days, and they don't get vacation. So I signed up for a shearing course because I too wanted to break my back into a million different pieces. And this is actually our co-founder, Becky, bottom middle red flannel. Her and I are just, you know, belting it out. Um, you know, Bowen method style shearing, definitely made for the six foot tall lanky male figure, not really for the female an anatom anatomy structure. Um, so it was, a, it was an incredible learning experience for us in that I'd helped with many shearings, but actually being the one there coming off of a back injury. <laughs> so um, the gentleman, Doug, on the upper left, took a swift kick to his shin, went to the hospital, took 60 stitches, got back on the shearing table, and just went back right to work. Amazing. This is pretty normal from what I hear in the shearing world. Um, and so we, so that was one of our one of our learning processes. The other thing was getting getting cloth, getting fabric. I was able to get yarns in in Ontario, which was wonderful, but getting things like lace or just repeatable cloth, um, or even wanting to try crazy things like upcycled denim fabric, which is what you see on the bottom right and what you see on my body today. Um, you know, it's, it's important for us to talk about all the waste that's generated in, um, in the fashion industry. And so, you know, we in Canada don't wear wool year round. We do wear some cotton. Um, so we wanted to give a nod to garment waste. And so what is it that farmers tend to go through the most? Jeans. So we took all of these busted jeans and we broke them down and we sewed the panels together and slit cut them and then rewove them and made a wonderful textile out of them. Um, so we're gonna lean harder into that. Um, same deal with our you know, custom wovens. Uh, we wanted to try North American lace using North American fiber, just, just to see if we could. So there's Deborah Livingston Lowe of Upper Canada Weaving. She is stellar. And what I mean by that is, she was one of these incredible artisans who had been told, your, your expertise will never make money. What a nice hobby you will always have to have. So when I found her, she was weaving tea towels, incredible tea towels, like unbelievable. And, and she's a teacher, which explains why she has so much patience for me. And so I came at her with these crazy ideas. And I said, I, th I think we can make cloth. Like, let's make Canadian fabric and let's, let's Let's Pendleton this. Like, let's make some change in 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 you know this industry. And she was she's like, okay, I think you're nuts, but I'm willing to try this because why not? And now she's she's churning out our fabric. Um, so these are some of the materials that we were able to come by. Um, we're still always churning out new materials, um, improving the ones that we have made, um, learning more about the process as you do it for the first time. 
so keep in mind, runway's, runway's weird. Yeah. Um, I have never been a consumer of high fashion myself. You know, putting on heels and makeup is like a real chore commitment from me. I would much prefer, you know, my, my muddy boots and a pair of Carhartts all day, any day. But I have come to see that change in the fiber, uh, in the textile industry does start in the luxury sector and trickle its way down. And why that's important to realize is because the dollars that you pay in a luxury good, they're like, they're like funding for new systems that you're having to create the mold for. And it's as we prove these systems and make scale, we're going to be able to offer lower price points. We're going to be able to offer larger systems. I'm so thankful for all the research that California Fiber Shed does because there are a lot of brands that can't, they can't stop the presses. So it's important to give them systems to make change sustainably over time. So in that note, we started in the high fashion sector because we wanted to prove to the world that North American fiber absolutely can compete. And you know what? It can do it sustainably, and it can support so many more local jobs than just the making. It can support biodiversity. It can actually help spread awareness throughout a community of human-to-human -human contact. And how cool is it to buy a garment and know that you are supporting artisans and mills and farmers who are doing good things? You know, the the numerous people who were told oh fiber what a what a cute agricultural product you know i'm gonna that's that's not real farming um you know same with all the artisans that i work with that's not real you know industry that's 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 your hobby so so we radically wanted to prove that no no this this could be viable industry so you're gonna see all natural colors. There was no dye used. Um, the hides are all alpaca hides, um, all uh, sustainably uh, raised in Ontario and tanned also in Ontario. The whole collection is um, grown, raised, uh, milled, and made in Ontario. Our our intention will always be source first from the fiber shed, source second from Ontario, then Canada, and then we'll pull from the states when we need to. So our linings are organic cotton grown from the Texas Organic Cotton Co-op milled in North and South Carolina. Um, to start that, to start what that conversation should be around those farming practices. So keep in mind. <laughs> Yeah, I love you guys too. <laughs> um, so keep in mind when you see the runway collection, runway means drama. So you're going to see some drop necklines, you're going to see some, some short hemlines, but when it goes to retail, that kind of changes because you know, people don't wear that. Yeah. yeah. So we can't offer a lot of hand-knit garments. We pay people by the hour. We don't pay the minimum wage. We pay people you know, where their skill sets lie. If you're if you are 20 years in your industry, you're not making minimum wage. Why would you want to enter into that industry? So we try to offer sustainable pay models. So we were able to get hand knitting into some of our accessories, which was a really nice nod. Um, so this one was interesting. I put this on the runway and I thought, oh, this one's kind of wah, wah. But this one got cheered around the runway because it was Canadian fashion industry elites going, yes, there's something I can wear in the winter. And it looks good. <laughs> Wild. Um, yep, yeah, we, we did an evening gown. Not because, I don't know, because we needed to prove that we could. Because we have, you know, international film festivals that come to Toronto and they need things to wear. So why aren't they gonna wear our fiber shed? You know, why not? Let's 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 dream big here. So <laughs> so um so a footnote about this competition is this competition, it's a it's big and it's annual. And it's the judges, uh, there are four judges. One, Suzanne Rogers, who's the, um, the female part to the um, Rogers communication. You know, it's like if AT&T had a lady, then, you know, that, that's Suzanne Rogers for Canada. Um, so her, she consumes the most incredible fashion. Uh, Suzanne Timmons, who is the VP head buyer of Hudson's Bay Company. And Cameron Williamson of Flair Magazine and David Dixon, who is essentially the equivalent of a Ralph Lauren, but in Canada. So those were the judging panel 
uh, people, and they really had no interest in sustainable or local or farming practices, like nothing. There's no. They cared about it being fashion forward. So it was very interesting to enter into a competition where there were no extra points given for, oh, yes, this is a closed loop cycle. Yes, this is, you know, this is very sustainable and, you know, we can, all these jobs in, in Canada. Yeah, no, no, didn't care. So, so one of the remarks from the judges was, oh, we love your closures. I had these nice big wood buttons on them, but I really want to see like a nice big chunky piece of antler on there. And I went, oh, do you now? You have no idea what it takes to to legally source antler in Ontario. That's cool though, I will get you some antler. So, <laughs> so we found a button maker in Rockwood who makes buttons and because everyone knows he makes buttons, they always give him his natural shed antler uh, finds when they you know, go, are foraging. And so he said, absolutely, how many you want? What size do you want? So I'm sitting in his kitchen with him and we're taping off antlers. And I'm like, I think it's gotta be like this. And he's like, I, that's, that's nuts. And I'm like, I know, I, fashion is nuts. So, so, <laughs> so, um, so that's that face. Um, this coat was really exciting for me. It's felt, it's a felt coat. And, and the biggest fear the judges had about accepting my application was that it was going to look a little too homespun. So when they wanted this piece on the runway, you know, when, when, when these news publications started calling saying, that felt coat, we need that for this editorial shoot that we're doing, it was like, okay, cool, felt, here we go. Because it wasn't yarn. Yarn is something that's pretty doable in Ontario, but felt. Felt something we got to work on. So that was, that was pretty neat. Um, and this piece, yep, jumper. This would be a maxi dress in production because, you know, torso length variations. Um, again, another piece. And this, this hand knit shawl is actually hand knit by one of the women who started, who founded one of our largest um, fiber festivals in Ontario, Linda Curry. Um, so it really enlivened the, um, our local fiber industry. It was a real nod for them. Um, again, knit on knit. Uh, we incorporated a lot of machine knit uh, because it was a, just a really viable use of our, of our fiber sheds um, materials. And this piece is one of my favorites um, because even, even our trim is traceable. Even our buttons are traceable. The only things that aren't traceable our zippers and thread, and our thread is Canadian, but the fiber I cannot trace. So this piece, um, Deborah Livingston Lowe and I worked together to really engineer a fabric that would hit minimums and really get into that nice sweet spot for pricing, but would also be able to be used in many ways. So you can see here that the fabric is broken up into many different sections, and that hem on the bottom, we were able to cut and use this trim for cuffs and surface details on other pieces. Um, she engineered the width of the fabric so that we would have to make as few cuts as possible because hand weaving alone on top of the spinning costs so expensive. So when you see our hand woven garments, you're gonna see you're gonna see minimized construction. We're really trying to maximize what that fabric is doing. And we're not gonna put a ton of seams into it because we too are having issues with fabric finishing and finding those outlets locally. So Maybe we can, you know, get in on that together. Um, so, so this one's pretty neat. The fur cuffs hide their hides, technically. Um, cuffs, for me, were pretty validating because this is the first alpaca that this farmer had, taffy. And buying this hide from him was, was hard because he wasn't sure he wanted to part with it. And I don't blame him. Um, but being able to show him this afterwards, to bring him the coat, to have him touch it, to see this published in Glow magazine, it was really exciting to be able to say, look at what your farm can do. And look at what your wonderful animal husbandry can do. So on each of our garments, you're going to find a small book. Not really, but our hang tag, which looks like a small book. And <laughs> it's going to talk about every farm, every mill, and every maker who is responsible for that process. And I've had many buyers look at those tags and go, ah, oh, this looks kind of expensive. I'm like, yeah, it is. It's not going anywhere. This is what this garment needs to 
be in your hands right now. So when we won this competition, a lot of the supply chain was there. And, you know, I don't really think people understood just how big of a gamble this was in that there were so many people behind this entry. And so it wasn't, it didn't really feel like my win, to be perfectly honest. You know, people ask, well, why is your name the company? I'm like, well, because I want people to know who to blame when it all goes under, you know, like. <laughs> Um, and it is. Uh, I, I had to meet these farmers and try to explain something that was farmers, mills, and makers, and try to explain something that wasn't yet in the market and say, we can really make some change here. I think this could work. And some were really skeptical, to be fair. You know, your fiber is your calling card for the year. If it goes missing because someone mismanaged it or made something that you're not proud to show, well, that's, that's kind of a setback. So every person that sold me their fiber and worked with me on the milling and the making was a part of the design process in that they saw it, I talked through it all with them, I explained the strategy behind it, and yes, I went to a lot of their homes and got them dressed and ready for this, you know, event, because I knew that they were, you know, leaving their comfort zone as a, as a favor, as, as, you know, they were trusting in me. And so, what was really fun is when they all showed up at the event, they would sort of go, hey, that kind of looks like what I'm wearing. Are you here with, <gasps> you're here with Peggy Sue, aren't you? Oh, okay. And then in the lobby, you would see these people just finding each other and just, you know, oh yeah, it's this, and I love this. Well, let me try what you're wearing on. And they just swapped. In. And so you saw this group coalescing in the lobby that was, they were just having a great time. They were laughing. You do not laugh at fashion events. They were smiling. You don't smile at fashion events. And, and so what was really neat was this crowd of fashion industry elites, because this is, they were all there. All of a sudden was like, who's this crowd? Why are they having so much fun? And what do I have to do to be in that crowd? And it was just like the wildest thing, seeing the tables turned all of a sudden. Um, you know, and our group consisted of farmers and mills and makers and a lot of engineers. And, um, and everyone was just really excited to share the information. So what was neat was you saw a, a lot of people who typically had felt alienated from one another, um, who were who had been so hurt by not being allowed to come into the, you know, come to the table, um, were talking. They were putting aside their, um, their judgments and just, they wanted to learn. They wanted to be a part of it. They knew that this was, that this could be a big meaning to actually support someone's livelihood. So, so it was a pretty, it's a pretty exciting night. Um, so at the end of the day, what does my company do? We add value, period. We get to know our farmers, we get to know our mills and our makers, and we see where the waste is, we see where the need is, and that's, at the end of the day, what we try to do is add value. Natural shed antler closures and jewelry pieces, mill ends as fabric, you know, bringing in organic cotton to start that conversation. Um, and, and in everything, you know, as much as possible, add value. So it's really exciting to be able to share this with you today, to be able to say this is what our fiber shed can do. And this is what fiber sheds can do. I think the world's ready for it. I think they're itching for it. I think people want to know where their things come from. I think they want to go visit their farmer and hug them for giving them the fiber that's clothing their back. So on that note, Thank you, Fibershed. <laughs>